I'm not looking at you, okay? How did the homework go? Yeah. I was walking down the hall in the church, had people like look at me and be like, I'm going to do it. I'm like, I didn't say anything. I just That's between you and the Lord. That must be your issue, you know? I'm not, I'm not on you about it. I just, I just find there's so much value in just reading the Scriptures. Just, just reading the Word. Just, you know, people get so wrapped at times about, I have, to, I have to understand every last thing that I read. Well, you'll never read anything if you have to understand every, you'll never get anything if that's the, the, the way that you approach the Scriptures. Yes, try to understand. Yes, be, be urgent and focused in your, in your attention, but, but read it. Acts is a narrative. It's a long story, chapter 1 to chapter 28. It's one big, long narrative. Just read it like a story. You will get so much just reading it. So if you haven't done it yet, I encourage you, read the book of Acts between now and next Sunday. It'll take you about two hours and 15 minutes in one setting, or uh, you, know, you can do it in 20-minute chunks or whatever. But it's just not, it's not a hard read. If, if your translation, I don't talk about this very often, if your translation is difficult, Get another translation. Find something that makes sense to you. Don't, don't be so committed to reading out of a particular translation because that's what your mom did or that's what grandma told you or that's what your Sunday school teacher said, that you, that you labor over the words and can't enjoy the narrative. Just get to something that's good. New Living Translation is a very flowing, easy to understand translation. NIV is easy to understand. Grab one of those if you're struggling with whatever translation you have. So two weeks ago, last week was Youth Sunday, which was fantastic, loved it, um, Youth did such a great job, uh, but we, we broke away from this series of messages on life in the Spirit. Now we're going back to that this morning. So two weeks ago, we talked about the Holy Spirit as being baptizer, and we're going to pick up kind of this is Holy Spirit as baptizer part two this morning. So um, if you thought we did a lot of Scripture that Sunday, just hold on. We're going to be in even more Scripture this morning. I promise I will do my very best to go quickly with it and give you the content without us laboring through these long passages, because I want you to see in four different sections of the book of Acts where the baptism of the Holy Spirit is expressed in a way that brings clarity to what God is doing overall through the book of Acts with His Spirit. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 2. So if you have your Bible or your, you know, the paper kind or the device kind, would you turn to Acts chapter 2? Remember, we're talking through this series of messages about three main roles the Spirit plays. He moves us into Christ. The Spirit enables us to think and act like Christ, to live like Christ. And the Spirit empowers us to minister like Christ. So this last section, this is week eight of this series, this last section of messages is all about being empowered, which is where we come to the the Holy Spirit as baptizer. So in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse uh, 1 of that chapter, we, this is the, you know, we've been here a bunch. This is the kind of inaugural spot where the church gets born and the, the spirit age begins. The Holy Spirit's been around since the beginning, amen? Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, right? The spirit is hovering over the, the, the water. So he's been around the whole time. He's been around before, believe it or not, he was around before Genesis chapter 1. He's been around forever. Acts chapter 2, at the day of Pentecost, when the church is born, a new era of the Spirit's ministry begins. The Spirit works differently. Same Spirit, different kind of work as of that moment. The initial outpouring of the Spirit takes place. There are 120 uh, adults, I guess. It doesn't say there are any children there, but there's 120 that are the first congregation. They're gathered in the upper room. They were told to wait. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes. So that's what they're doing. They're all in one place. They're in unity. They're there in prayer, it says, and they're just kind of hanging out, waiting for the Spirit to be poured out. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, the Spirit's poured out. Let me read it to you. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Verses 1 to 4 say this out of the ESV. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit comes and pours out on everyone that's present, 120 people. It's not, 
It's not like 120 people in this room. This is a second story. There's not high rises. It's just second story, probably very small room, probably something like we would experience if we were in a third world situation where we we're trying to have a church meeting with limited space. But I'm just imagine sardine can. Everybody is jammed into this tight space. They're there together. They're worshiping. They're listening to the Lord. They're praying together. And the Spirit's poured out. And this amazing thing takes place. And according to verse 11 of chapter 2, they, as they speak in tongues, what they're speaking are praises. The people that are gathered in Jerusalem for this Feast of Pentecost, they gather around the outside of this house as these people come tumbling into the street, speaking in all these different languages, and they say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God. So, so, so tongues, this initial evidence that we see in Acts chapter 2 for the baptism of the Spirit, tongues is, is initially all about bringing worship to God. Now, when I say speaking in tongues, um, that's the, the, the phraseology that the Scriptures use. But I will also most, more, more often than not, say spiritual language. For those of you that have been raised in church, have been around church for a long time, speaking in tongues can have a negative connotation. If you've been in a situation where that was kind of used as a as a measure for your spirituality, it can kind of feel negative. It, just the idea, uh, just the word tongue itself just conjures up, you know, I'm not going to do it, but you know, just, you know, that thing in your mouth that flops around and looks like a piece of meat. Yeah, that's what I think of when I think of tongue. And, I, and so saying, speaking in tongues, I mean, all speaking is technically in tongues, right? I mean, try, try speaking without using your tongue. So it's a little bit of a confusing, a little bit of an off-putting phrase. So, I will often say spiritual language because that's what we're talking about. These folks in Acts chapter 2 began to be able to speak languages they had previously not learned. So, we're not talking about them all coming down and speaking in different languages that they had studied. They were given supernatural enablement to be able to speak in languages that others would understand in, at that particular time, Acts chapter 2 speak, because all these people were gathered from all these different nations, all these different tongues, languages, they were able to speak these languages without ever having learned them. That was the evidence that accompanied the initial outpouring of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. That thing that happened, we're going to talk about four of these, that first one, that one that happened was an all-Jewish audience. You have all Jewish people in the upper room and all Jewish people down in the streets because they're there for the big festival. They're there for Pentecost, okay? Number two, Acts chapter 8. Turn to Acts chapter 8. I'll try to go quickly because there's a lot. Acts chapter 8 is great. Another, this is the second primary place where we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8 is kind of a revival setting that takes place in a city of Samaria. So jump, if you and don't turn there, but Acts chapter 6, church is growing, great things are happening. Just like every church, as the church grows, there's problems, people start complaining. Could you imagine that, that people complain at church? Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm so glad that's not grace. <laughs> people start complaining, and so the apostles are like, man, we can't deal with these problems. Let's pick, let's, let's delegate. That's a code language for it. Get someone else to do it. So they, they delegate to seven men filled with the Spirit, and one of the most famous of those seven is a man named Stephen, who is martyred in Acts chapter 7. He's the first person killed for his faith. But another one of the men in that list in Acts chapter 6 is a guy named Philip, and it's Philip because of persecution that is taking place in Acts in Acts. In Jerusalem, he, it is Philip that goes to Samaria in Acts chapter 8 because he wants out of Dodge. He's like, I don't want to get killed. I'm leaving. Did the Holy Spirit call him? Probably. But he also left because he was afraid. He ran and he gets to Samaria and he just begins preaching the gospel. He begins talking about Jesus and telling what Jesus has done. And his preaching is accompanied with signs and wonders, which we'll talk about next week. He begins to do these things. And as he is preaching, people are coming to Christ. They are getting saved. In the, in the born-again sense of this, they're understanding for the very first time that, that Jesus has been lived a perfect life, has died, has been buried, has risen from the dead, and ascended to heaven, has poured out the Spirit. So they are believing the good news. And when they begin to come to Christ, the word gets back to Jerusalem, Acts chapter 8, and they say, hey, you know, we need to send some authorities up there. Oh, by the way, Philip was doing really well on his own, but they decide they're going to send some of the apostles. So Peter and John, two of the original 12, go up to the city in Samaria, and they, while they are there, they begin to pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to look with me, Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 14, as soon as I find it in my Bible. 
It says this, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Philip's conducting revival services. People are getting saved. People are experiencing miracles. All this kinds of great stuff's happening. Peter and John show up. Oh, by the way, they're being baptized too. They're accepting Christ. They're believing. They're being born again. They're being water baptized. Then it turns out that um, Peter and John show up. They begin to lay hands on them. The Holy Spirit begins to them. So they're spirit baptized after that. So all of these things are taking place. It's this great revival. Now, this particular text does not say that speaking in tongues or spiritual language is present or is part of what's going on. My, this is Tim's theology for a second. My suspicion is that they were speaking in tongues because there's this guy in the crowd who has already, interestingly, who has already responded and baptized. His name is Simon, and he's a magician, and he really foolishly tries to buy the ability to lay his hands on someone. He says to Peter, I want to, can I give you money so that when I lay my hands on someone, they'll receive the Spirit as well? I don't think he, I think he was wanting to buy a particular thing that he was seeing. So my guess is they were speaking in tongues. They were, they were, you know, worshiping like maybe like in Acts chapter two, and he wanted this power. And of course, Peter's very gracious with him. He pulls Simon aside, puts his arm around, hey, Simon, buddy, let me explain. You know, he's like, may your money perish with you, you know, because you thought you could buy the gift of God. He just hammers him, just goes all hardcore on him. So Acts chapter eight, second outpouring. Now that group of people are, and I'm gonna say this very gently, they are not pure Jews. They live in Samaria, so they are, I would say Jewish, but that's a thing. They are Hebrew-ish. They're kind of Jews. They're partially Jews. They're they're mixed race or half breed is what Jewish people would see them at. They would see them as mongrels, really. So you've got Jews speaking to Jews and a Jewish thing happening in Acts 2 and Acts chapter 8. You have this Hebrew-ish thing going on where you've got Jewish ministers, but you've got those that are receiving that are not pure Jews. Now look in Acts chapter 10. Turn two pages to your right. Acts chapter 10, third example of of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter is in a place called Joppa. He's, uh, he's kind of the big deal in the first half of the book of Acts. Peter's like the main character other than Jesus, of course, in the spirit. The back half of the book of Acts, it really shifts to being Paul. But Peter's still kind of the front runner at this point. And in Acts chapter 10, he is at a place called Joppa. He's hanging out with a man named Simon, different Simon than the one in Samaria. And he, is, he has this vision and he's told by God, you know, don't treat people differently, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, treat everybody the same. And some people show up at this house and they say, we want you to come with us. And because Peter's had this vision, he's okay to go with them. So the next day they go to a place called Caesarea. And in Caesarea, there's a man named Cornelius who is a centurion. He's a Gentile, does not have that background. And he is, but he is a devout man. He's a God follower. And he invites Peter to come into his house. And Peter and a group of other uh, folks from, um, from Joppa that were with him, other Jewish believers, they all go together to Caesarea, to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius basically says, you know, yeah, Peter says, what do you want me to do? And Cornelius says, I don't know. I was just told to bring you here. And so Peter's a preacher, right? So Peter, preachers don't need, you know, I really don't need any of this stuff, right? I mean, I could just talk because we're talkers. And so Peter goes, okay. And he just starts getting up there and just starts talking and explaining things all about the gospel, all about what God's doing. And all of a sudden, while he's speaking, something powerful happens. Look, Acts chapter 10, verse 44. It says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter, that is, that's the Jewish people that came with Peter from Joppa to Caesarea. It says, the the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Verse 46, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues, spiritual language, and extolling God. They were giving worship. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So a couple of cool things about this. Number one, this is the, now a non-Jewish audience. These all Gentiles. It says that Cornelius called his friends and family and had them all in the house. So these are not Jewish people. They don't necessarily have much of a background we know that Cornelius was a doubt, devout man, but we don't know much more beyond that about him. He was a good guy. And he brought all these people in, and so they've not been baptized in water. Matter of fact, they, they may not have even fully accepted Christ yet. They're just seeking God and their people of faith. And while, and while Peter is speaking, the Spirit falls on them. 
I mean, no, not even any hands laying on. It's just like Acts 2. All of a sudden, just all of a sudden, boom, they start breaking out. And then, of course, the Jewish folks are there. They're, they're like, I thought that was just for us. You know, they're talking to each other like, are you serious? This is for everybody? And so they're like, oh my goodness, this is for everybody. This is totally a, this is a, we can't appreciate because we don't live then how big of a deal this was for, for the spirit to be poured out on Gentiles as well as Jews. It was the ultimate equalizer. I mean, it's basically like we're all on the same team. God, God's into everybody just as much. Because if you're a Jew, you understand you're chosen. Now, that's a great name for a, a video series. You're chosen. <laughs> but the reality is everybody's chosen. And so Peter's like, well, there's no reason we can't get these guys baptized in water. So they get them all baptized in water, which is really out of order, isn't it? They're Christians, and then they got baptized in spirit, then they got baptized in water. Listen, just for the record, he will do whatever he wants to do in the order that he wants to do it. Every time, listen, I've just saved you a lot of grief that I've experienced in my life. Every time we try to systematize and make a recipe out of how God works, we will be disappointed because he loves to be like, you think you got me? Right. And just does something different. It's just the way that he is. Acts chapter 19, last one. So four, ch- four pages to the right. Acts 19, this is the funniest one. So now, we're, now it's Paul. Paul is going to um, Ephesus, verse 1, chapter 19. And it happened that, that Apo- while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. So he finds some, some they're called disciples, so they're followers of the way. They're followers of God, but they, again, they have an incomplete understanding. They don't know a ton. Verse 2, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This is, the scriptures are funny. This is funny. This next line is funny. They say, no, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit, which is hilarious. Like, so they're the disciples, and they are, they're trying to follow God. They're not even aware that God has the Holy Spirit, so, or that the Holy Spirit is God. So it says in verse 3, he said to them, what were you baptized then? And they say, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. Verse 5, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus. They got more understanding. John's baptism, remember Luke chapter 3 where we started this, he's saying, you know, I baptize you with water, but one's coming after me who will baptize you with the Spirit. He was out there telling people to repent, turn from your evil ways, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People were coming out in droves and were being, were being converted. They were repenting. They were wanting to follow God, but they didn't understand Jesus. These guys are following God with this understanding that they've been cleansed through baptism of repentance, but they don't have any idea who Jesus is. So Paul explains it to them, gets them baptized in water. I, this is baptism, by the way. Whenever I do that, that's what this is. Did you know that? I guess I could do it this way too. Yeah, they, they, get, they get wet, they get dunked. And then verse five on hearing this, the baptizing water, at verse 6, I'm sorry. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, so they're out of the water, dried off, whatever. Paul lays his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying, and there were about 12 of them in all. Okay, this is, a, this is a, such a neat thing because they didn't know anything. They know very, very, very little. But they, with what they have, they are moving forward. We have John's baptism. Oh, there's Jesus. Okay, we accept Jesus. We want to baptize him. Oh, okay, lay hands on us. Now we start speaking in tongues. They're not like, you know, elite spiritual people at this point, but the Spirit is poured out on them in the same way that it was in Acts 2 and in Acts 8 and in Acts 10. Now it's in Acts 19. So if you're sitting here this morning and you are thinking to yourself, why on earth does he go through all of this stuff? Like, why would we go over all that? Why study the early church? Why know the book of Acts? Why is it important for us to know the book of Acts? On your sheets, if you're taking the notes down this morning, write this in. Why study the early church? Because we study it because what they experienced is what we should expect. What they experience is what we should expect. There is no shortages of opinion about the Holy Spirit. Don't believe me? Type in Holy Spirit in Google. Just start scrolling. You will see everything. I don't encourage you to do that, actually. That's just, don't waste your time. We only have certain places that we can get reliable information. This is the primary one. So when we read the book of Acts and we see what God did, it sets up within us an expectation that he will do that again. What God will do in the future is informed by what God did in the past. Not necessarily all the details. He's not going to become a formula. But we get insight into what his heart is and what he wants for people by looking at what he did in the past. So when we look at Acts, we see ethnicities. He's, he's ministering to Jews. He's ministering to people that are Hebrew-ish. He's ministering to full-on Gentiles. 
we look and we see that he is doing things in various places. Jerusalem is here, about 30 miles north is Samaria. It's down in topography, but it's north on the compass. About 50 miles from Jerusalem, a little better than 50 miles is Caesarea. Ephesus, where these 12 guys are that don't even know about the Holy Spirit, that's 600 miles away. What, what the Lord shows us through the book of Acts is when Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth, he's giving us a picture of what he is expanding by the power of the Holy Spirit, the gospel being taken to the ends of the earth. In these four examples, we see it. Ethnicity is no longer an issue. Geography is no longer an issue. He does young and old. He does male and female. He does rich and poor. He is pushing down every one of the barriers that separated people up to that point. And he's saying the spirit is for everyone. The baptism is for everyone. The empowerment is for everyone because you're going to be my witnesses everywhere. What don't we see when we look at Acts? In particular, Acts 2, 8, 10, and 19. We don't see people seeking an experience. Like you don't see Philip in, in Samaria saying, who wants to be prayed for to be filled with the spirit? Who wants to, who wants to speak? You know, Peter and John don't say, who wants, who wants to come up here and speak in tongues? There's ministry that's going forth, but it is not in any way people just trying to have, pardon the expression, get a goose bump at church. It's not that. You also don't see coercion. Come on. I'm looking at Candy. She's over there. Come on, Candy. It's your morning. Come on down here. Let it. It's not that. There's a lot of people just saying, I, I want what God has for me. I'm surrendered. I'm not, I'm not trying to figure this all out. I'm just, whatever he wants for me, that's what I want. You don't see any resistance to the Spirit's work. Not in, not in the way that, that we feel like in the modern world, in the Western world, we as pastors have to try to convince people to overcome. There's not a lot of that in the Scriptures at all. There, there's, there's nothing of, this is just for super spiritual people. And it isn't that the thing that happens with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Someone speaks in tongues and all of a sudden, not everyone, but some of them seem like they think they're walking six inches off the ground. Like they're better. Like they had something to do with it, which is really weird. It's not just for the leader people. It's for the regular people. Everybody in the upper room, everybody that responded to Philip's teaching, everybody in Cornelius' house, all 12 of those guys in Ephesus. And finally, most importantly, write this down if you would, if you're taking the notes, there isn't any indication from Acts that the Spirit's baptism was intended only for first century believers. There's nothing written there that says that. Now, there is a whole swath of people that we love dearly, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who do not believe that any time after the writing of the book of Acts or after the first hundred years of the church, that the things that we see in the book of Acts are normative. They think that all of that stopped. And we love them and we honor them and we will partner with them to take the gospel around the world. But I will tell you the truth. That is not an argument or a position that is born from the scriptures. It's born from experiences, or I should say it's born from a lack of experience. And don't tell them this, but when we're all in heaven together, I'm going to look over and be like, no, no, I would never do that. I won't do that. It'll be so awesome. It'll be like our worship service. We'll be just focused on Jesus. It won't matter. But I do think that they are in error in this particular thing because there's nothing in the book that says that. We have the scriptures. Yes, it's a beautiful thing, but we also have the fullness of the spirit now. Now, why, why would we, why, why would, I mean, if you didn't know any better, you'd just believe me and we would just go for it. But why do people hold back? Why are they afraid of the work of the Holy Spirit? What is it about the Spirit um, and baptism in particular and speaking in tongues in specific that makes people just get skeptical or afraid? I think it's two things. It's the last fill-in on your sheets there. Two primary reasons. Number one is ignorance, that people just get they don't know. And so hopefully this kind of teaching helps eliminate some of that, but there's a lot of ignorance. And there's a lot of uh, teaching that, is, that, that promotes a sense of, well, that's gone, so I don't need to even think about that. I don't need to pursue the things of the Spirit. Ignorance is, the one, is one thing. The other thing, and I think it's the bigger thing, is control. We, as, in particular, as, as Western, when I say Western, I mean American, Canadian, Western European believers, followers of Jesus, we are by um, kind of cultural default, we are controllers. Would you, if, if you are a control freak or a, a recovering control freak, would you raise your hand? <laughs> wow, you guys are better. First service, like three people, I'm like, liars. <laughs> you guys are, all, we just like to control stuff, right? Like, I'm all about trusting Jesus as long as I can control it. 
which is very counter to the truth. The Holy Spirit will not be controlled. So the riches of what God offers to us through the Spirit only come when we are surrendered. And that does not mean I no longer have control of myself. Remember what one of the fruits of the Spirit is? Self-control. So the Spirit enables me to, to remain controlling myself, not going crazy or just falling into sin or whatever. I am empowered by the Spirit to control myself, but I will not control the Spirit. I have to yield to Him. I have to let go. I have to surrender to Him. And it's really arrogant to think that we would control Him anyway, even that we could think that we could understand everything about how this all works with the Spirit. I mean, let's be honest. Do we really understand everything that, in the, that we get from God anyway? It's like, think about it. Do, do, do you and I really understand the atoning work of Jesus on the cross? I mean, I, underst- I can tell you what it says in the book. I can tell you what I think about it. Do I really understand how a drop of blood from a man 2,000 years ago who was poor and had no heirs, had no, you know, I mean, this guy, his blood being shed on a Roman cross allows my life to be cleansed and pure before God Almighty who made the universe? I get it, but I don't get it. How about the incarnation? There's an easy one. Eternal God takes on flesh, comes to earth inside of a woman who's never had sexual relations and she bears him as a virgin. I get it. I don't get it. The resurrection, this body wrapped in 70 pounds of spices gets put in a tomb on Friday afternoon and on Saturday morning he walks, Sunday morning he walks out. I get it, but I don't get it. How the Holy Spirit pours himself out into our lives and baptizes us, enabling us to speak in languages we've never learned. I know what it says in the book, but I don't get it. It's by faith. It's by faith. It's by surrendering each of these things is taken in faith, experienced by faith, lived out by faith. And we access it by being willing to say, Lord, I don't have to understand fully to trust you. When I was uh, 17 years old, I gave my heart to Jesus. And about six months later, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. My story is, is that I went to plenty of prayer meetings, like Mona said two weeks ago in her grace story, where there was no shortage of people willing to put their hands on me and press me right down into the floor with the power of their arms, not the Spirit. <laughs> there's no connection between how hard you're prayed, how hard someone puts their hands on you and whether or not the Holy Spirit's moving. But that's what the people that prayed for me thought. So they're, yeah. And I was so discouraged because here's what I thought theologically. I thought if I don't speak in tongues, I'm not baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in the same way that we receive salvation by faith, whether we feel anything or not, we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith When we say, Lord, baptize me with your spirit. I want everything and all that you have for me. He baptizes us at that moment. Whether we speak in tongues right then or not. Now, I believe, and from the scriptures, from the book of Acts, everyone who is baptized in the spirit has the capacity to speak in tongues. And I'll talk a lot more about that next week in regard to the spiritual gift of tongues. But it doesn't have to happen in the moment. So for me, I was, uh, and I apologize if you didn't know this, at that time, I was 18, I was a rent a cop. I had the light blue shirt, the dark blue pants, the no gun, uh, the flashlight, the little fake badge, you know. And I had this job where every hour for eight hours each night I had to walk through this empty building and keep it safe, you know, from itself or whatever. And I would go through, and it was a computer computing center for the Marriott Corporation. It was when they had mainframes, and so there was these big rooms full of mainframes. For those of you younger than me, those are computers. And they would, they would, have, to be, it would have to be cold in there because the mainframes didn't work if it was too hot. So there's air conditioners running, really loud fans. And I'm discouraged because I really want to be back baptize the spirit, which I already am, but what I really wanted was my spiritual language. And so I'm walking, I'm doing my, you know, with my flashlight, doing my little thing. And um, I get in the mainframe room in the middle of the night and I'm like, Lord, would you just let me be able to worship you like they did in Acts? And I felt, I, I, I started to praise him in my English and then I started to feel, oh my goodness, I can, I can really, I, I feel in something. So I, of course, I'm by myself, right? So I'm like, I'm just going to shout it. And I start speaking praise to God. And then I have this thought, that sounds like Vietnamese. And then I thought, I've been watching those Chuck Norris movies. 
like missing in action. And I bet I grabbed hold of something I heard in that movie. And now I'm just saying it because I want this so badly. I'm making it up. And the spirit of God just spoke to my heart. And said, Absolutely not. I gave you this. This is legitimate. Whether you think it sounds like somebody else's or language or, or it sounds like a movie or whatever, you trust me. You pray. You're by yourself. You're not trying to impress anybody. You're not on a stage. You're not in a group. You're all by yourself. You worship me. So every night, every night, every round that night, each hour as I'd go through the mainframe room, I'd walk really slowly and I would shout my praises to the Lord. And it did sound like something from Southeast Asia. <laughs> And it doesn't anymore, so I'm not sure what was going on there exactly, but I do know this. I was already baptized in the Holy Spirit when I went to work that night. What I needed was to get over myself, to get over my need to control, to get over the sense that it needs to be like this person's or that person's, or it needs to sound pretty and flowing. You hear somebody pray in the Spirit, and it just flows, and you're like, wow. And you hear somebody else, and me, and it sounded like a little three-year-old learning how to figure out language, and that was okay. We want everybody at Grace who says, Lord, I surrendered you. We want everyone to be able to be baptized in the Spirit and to eventually, either in the moment or eventually, experience spiritual language. We're gonna take communion together, and I'm running late. I'm so sorry. Um, we're gonna take communion together. So Susan and I are gonna distribute. Would you come forward in just a moment and get your communion elements? We're gonna pray together. And then after communion, if there's gonna be a prayer team here. If you would like to be prayed for, and all we're gonna do is what they do in Acts, lay hands on and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you may speak in tongues, you may not right now, but you will be baptized either way once we pray with you, okay? So give me a second to put the gloves on, then let's get our communion elements. The... Uh the bread and, the, and the, the juice, the symbols of the body and blood of Christ. Uh, the, this, is the, this is where the church gets its identity. We are the people, if nothing else, we are the people who understand what this means, right? We get this. We have personally experienced the healing touch of God and the cleansing of our sins through his blood. This is, this is what defines the church. But what defines the church's mission is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's what drives us into the world. It's what drives us to meet our neighbors. It's what, it's what makes us able to speak the word of life to our family members and our friends. And so we want to be people who are, who are embracing all that God has for us, not only just remembering and appreciating the body and blood of Jesus, but also being filled with the Spirit for the purpose of seeing heaven populated and hell plundered. So would you stand with me? We're going to take communion together. Would you close your eyes and just think for a moment? The symbols of what you're holding, healing and atonement, forgiveness and grace. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 says this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We want to take a moment before we take this communion meal, as before we remember and celebrate what Jesus has done for us, to once again ask that the, the power of what was accomplished on the cross and through the resurrection would be applied to our lives. And so... I'm just going to be quiet for a few moments, but I ask you to think about your life where you need to repent, where you need to surrender, where you need that cleansing of the blood of Jesus. Would you, would you pray right now? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. We receive your forgiveness. We receive your healing. We confess our sins, knowing that you're faithful and that you are just. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we hold these elements knowing, well, no, not really knowing, Lord, only having the smallest understanding of how powerful they are. They are so powerful. They're the difference between life with you forever and life apart from you, Lord. Saying yes to you, saying yes to your sacrifice, saying yes to your resurrection life, saying yes, yes to your spirit. We do that again this morning. We remember the price that was paid 
We don't take it lightly. We don't, we don't do this as a matter of, of uh, ritual or just some form that we observe. We pause and we remember and we say thank you. May this be uh, life to us. May this ignite new closeness with us as we remember your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take the body and blood of Jesus? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to bless you before I send you out, before I let you go, but um, there will be prayer team members up front here. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, like someone to lay hands on you and pray with you, we would be honored to do that. If it's been a long time, I was talking to someone not too terribly long ago, and they said, you know, you just kind of get out of the practice of walking in the Spirit, using your spiritual language. We would love to pray with you as well. Please um, don't, if I can say it this way, don't demand control. Surrender and let the Lord minister to you this morning. Stand your hands before I want to speak this blessing over you in the name of the Lord. Grace Church family, may the spirit of the Lord rest upon you. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. May that rest upon you. And please remember, you've not been given the spirit of this world but a spirit, the spirit who is from God, that we might receive all things and understand all things freely given us by God. In the name of Jesus, be blessed. Amen.